mad, 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 mad world out there, isn't it? <laughs> Good Lord. We got a lot to cover today. It's going to be a very interesting program. I hope you all got a pad of paper and some notes. Those of you that may want to uh, take your time, keep in mind, you can store this, save it, take photoshops, whatever else you want to do. Uh, we got a lot of slides here. It took us a little extra time. Sorry, we're bringing in here at 7.06 on uh, Saturday night. Goodness, we got a lot to cover. If we don't get some rational thought in the central banking world and in the policy world, then specifically there's going to be a failed bond auction here in the United States. And if that happens, you know all hell is going to break loose. Oh, did I say say that? And so we're going to start into stagflation and possibly deflation. We're going back to the Irvin Fisher debt spiral. Let's see that. What is an early Irving Flesher debt deflation spiral? It's called a bank run, folks. Let's just put a different set of lipstick on it, okay? When a large group of depositors rush to withdraw their money from a bank deemed at risk or going under. Let's take a quick look over at the U.S. debt clock, and I'll show you where all the, the hubbub is coming from. So the U.S. debt clock, okay, is currently showing that we have only $20 trillion. That's a lot of money to you and I, but not when there's $623 trillion of liabilities against the $20 trillion, $23 trillion that there. That is what's causing the bank run. Let's skip that and keep running. So we got the bank run there. Next, we're going to talk about velocity of money. The velocity, can we get that up? The velocity of money is actually crashing right now. This combined with the velocity, with the, um, with the M2 money supply decreasing as well, gives two negative integers, which is going to create a negative output, which means the GDP is, in fact, going down. So the velocity of money we've talked about before, where um, where uh, Joel Levinston, I think that is, came, in, came into yeah. town and uh, he made that movie Tin Men. And he said he was going to spend like $20 million in the, in the state of Maryland and Baltimore making this movie. But the economic impact would be like $75 million. That's because that money comes in and then it's circulated around inside our economy, which creates more velocity of money, all about Keynesian economics. Okay, and what that does is it keeps more people um, employed. However, the, the opposite can happen, which is what we're seeing right now, is what's called ver reverse velocity of money. And then when you see it, that's when you see a, an absolute uh, sucking sound. The lack of curiosity about risk has allowed a dangerous situation to fester. A perilous financial collapse is knocking at the door. Folks, I, I'm reading your comments. People are saying, "Hey, the dollar is dead. Fiat all over the place at the same time. It's all hitting down." Uh, stability is deceptive. We've got a strong headline, growth showing gross domestic product numbers, job growth, declining inflation figures, mask an imminent financial crisis fueled by excessive government spending and excessive cre credit conditions, causing further declines in the velocity of money because it's all future demand brought into yesterday that we now have to absorb into our economy. So we brought in five or 10 years of future uh, demand into today. It's going to take that long in order for all that to work its way throughout the system. So we're going to break that down into two parts here today. We really haven't had any financial discipline. And so what's happening now is you got the levels of the debt to GDP, gross domestic product here in the United States, well over 100 percent. Typically, what that means is you're insolvent. So what that means is that we're we had some charts. OK, we're going to look at uh, let's see. Let's see. So anyway, let's take a look at what happened in uh, World War One levels. OK. World War I, we had a deficit of 6.5%. The U.S. government needs to finance and refinance the debt over the next five years, which is 56% of the $34 trillion all needs to be reset. The math, folks, just simply doesn't work. We're looking at war here. This is what happens. You got Social Security. You got Medicaid. The math just simply doesn't work. There's not enough workers out there to support the aging baby boomers like the pig and the python that we learned about long ago when we were at elementary school and learning about economics back then. Or did we learn about economics in elementary school? I don't know. Maybe I went to a different elementary school. No, well, I was, I was college bound. My mom and dad said, you are going to learn something here, young man. So if we don't get some rational thought in the central bank world, in the policy world, that's specifically Specifically, there's probably there's going to be a failed bond auction in the United States. And that happens. All heck is going to break loose. And when you look at the inversion of the yield curve, let's take a look at the, the yield curve. This is an inverted yield curve. What this basically means is that short term rates are higher than long term rates. That's not right, is it? Would a 30 year mortgage cost less than a, a two year mortgage? Then why wouldn't everybody take out a two year mortgage or whatever? A 10 year mortgage or 30. So the bottom line here is, folks, the banks, what they do is they borrow short term and they lend long term. If you take a look at a normal yield curve, can we take a look at a normal yield curve? OK, that's a consumer price index. Let's see if we have a normal yield curve. What that's going to show is a much lower interest rate at, during shorter periods of time. So what that means is that the banks will borrow short term 
couple a couple of percentage points and lend long term at six or eight percentage points. That's normal. But right now they have to borrow almost five percent and they're lending out less than that. So there's a backward situation. They're going backwards. So they need to refinance the debt. So that over the next five years, which is 56 percent of all that debt. So. When you look at the inversion of the yield curve and you look at the fact that growth is only predicted on government spending, we are in an economic make-believe world called a Potemkin village. We're going to move off the converted inverted yield curve there. Okay, we got the, uh, okay. Now we're going to talk about the consumer price index. Everybody knows that if you take over equivalent rent out of the consumer price index in the United States, it's below 2%. Owner's equivalent rent is a surveyor coming up to you asking you what you think the value of yours uh, rent is. Then we put it into an equation and basically lag it. Does that make any sense to you? But that's how they're figuring the CPI, the consumer price index. They have to find the most obscure, ridiculous ways to calculate a number that will make us all feel fine. But don't we eat beef? Don't we eat hamburger? Don't we, don't we consume electricity? Don't we consume gasoline? What's the price of all that doing? So what they're doing is they're taking obscure prices that, that, uh, that not the majority of Americans use, and they're, and they're baking that into a pie and say, oh, this is your new consumer price index, which is lower than what it really should be. Think about this, though. Think about what's driving this consumer price index number, which is driven by the motor vehicle insurance index. Remember, we're talking about sin taxes and how taking a flight on an airplane was a sin tax. Well, how about this? The consumer price index is driven by motor vehicle insurance index. It's in the CPI number, which is a lag piece of data, which is basically just working through the increases in car prices caused by COVID. There are Fed paper, working papers on this. I suggest if you want more information on it, please reach out to us and we'll provide you our notes. There is a section inside the, web, the, the website we have there that will allow you to download various of the different uh, uh, programs and the, the uh, documentation that we're mentioning here on the website and on the podcast. So the thing I find most interesting is Jerome Powell comes out and says he needs to have confidence that pertaining to the CPI going down. That's not true. You can't have any confidence in that. So look, the guy is not telling us the truth. When he came out the last FOMC meeting and said things are going to remain the same, if you go back and you take a look at the two-year and 10-year rate, you're going to find they actually went down. The same day that he made the arrange, the announcement that the interest rates are going to stay the same. So Rafi Farber has been talking about something called a pivot. And that's exactly what this is all about. So they can either choose to save the banks and kill the dollar, which is to drop the interest rates and stop people from rioting as much. Of course, it'll take shovelfuls of uh, dollar bills to buy a McDonald's hamburger. But the other, the other uh, side to that is they raise the interest rates. Nobody can borrow any money. Nobody has any money. We all starve to death. So one way the currency is worth anything, the other way starved to death. But bottom line is nothing can stop what is coming. Absolutely nothing can stop what is coming, folks. We're right there or right at the doorstep. So there are two plausible, reasonable assumptions that if we back in university talking, we would control the, for this sticky inflation about the mortgage entry cost. That's the central bank's rising, raising interest rates, 30 percent of the CPI. So we've talked about the consumer price index. A little out of order here. So uh, let's see. Now we're going to talk about immigration. Wow. You see all these new people coming in. What's the purpose there? The purpose is what's called a cloud pivot strategy. We don't have a, a, a slide on that. If you're interested to know what the cloud, C-L-O-W-A-R-D, cloud pivot strategy, P-I-V-E-E-N, that is designed to overwhelm governments. And that's what's happening here. There are millions of these undocumented illegals coming into our country and it's costing a fortune. And this is all part of this Keynesian model in order to crash the economy the way it is right now. So what I'd like you to do is there is a paper on the on our website. What is Keynesian economics? You really do need to read that. It's only about two paragraphs, all condensed into one. But it gives it tells you and explains to you the government intervention is how Keynesian economics works. Well, look at the different debacles that the government has run into with regards to their expertise in Keynesian economics. If we go back to Austrian monetary economics, the, the politicians can't promise you anything because it comes out of the ground at seven to one right now, as far as silver is concerned. We talked about that. So let's talk about this handbook of uh, macroeconomics. This fellow, John B. Taylor, is a graduate and teacher at uh, professor at Stanford University. The handbook of macroeconomics is all about the uh, the collapse of the of the economies. So this is happening on a global scale. One person made up uh, made a comment here about it seems like all the currencies around the current around the world are going down. 
Exactly. That's the BIS that issues all these negative currencies. Okay. And so all their currencies are going defunct at the same time. They're all going to be yanked out at the same time, going to be slipped, switched and slipped. The new asset backed currencies of all 207 sovereign countries will be in place. You'll wake up on a Monday morning and bingo, it'll all be a new world. Let's see if that's what actually happens. So the handbook, what I'd like to talk about now are the oil prices with regards to inflation. Okay. So let's narrow something down. It's not directly within the Fed's control. They can't control oil and inflation. Oil is pushing up the consumer price index right now. Is a rate cut still necessary? If they can't control a big C a chunk of the CPI, there is no interest, no, uh, no need to raise the interest rates. A seasonal factor, in my view, is of an oil trade between $70 and $90. And we can't be surprised that oil, as you know, is ramping up into the driving season as it always does. Inflation is always front end loaded. You get these seasonal factors that are happening that we should discount, right? If we're going to sit there with long and variable legs, 25 basis points cuts aren't going to do anything. Folks, we got to get the inflation rate. Up. I mean, we got to get the the um, the interest rate up above the inflation rate. So the inflation rate is 7.1 percent. The interest rate's got to go up to 7.1 percent. Otherwise, it's a negative environment. So what would happen if we raise the interest rates up to even 5 percent? Studies have shown everything falls apart. So be watching the uh, the two year and the 10 year. You'll find that the two year will not go above the, the 5 percent mark. If it does, better run for the hills, because that case, we cannot afford to pay 5 percent, not on a trillion dollars of, of a debt that's standing out there right now. So let's take a look at what the normal yield curve is. Again, I'm going to explain to you how the banks go about making money. So do you see on the far right hand side of the graph, the interest rate is high. OK. That would represent a 30 year mortgage. OK, take your cursor and go where the 30 year is on 30 years. See the see the one, two, three, four, five dots on the right hand side. Yes. OK, put your cursor there. Show them right here. I'll show you on mine. OK, circle it with your cursor there, honey. Honey. OK, I guess we got uh, different screens or something. Anyway, the bottom line is, is the 30 year note, OK, is going to carry a higher interest rate. So what they do is they borrow short term, say for two years or five years at a lower interest rate, lend it out to you on a 30 year at, say, eight or nine percent or seven percent. And they're making the difference in the spread. So if they're borrowing short term and lending long term, how can they borrow currently at five percent going back to the inverted yield curve and lend it out at, at four or five percent? on a 30 year note, you can't do that. But that's the way the banks have been operating. They borrow short term and they lend, um, they lend long term. So we're gonna talk about now with uh, regards what happened with um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the COVID deal, all right? The COVID deal. Here's $5 billion. Let's show them what $5 billion looks like, Margaret Ann. That's only 1 trillion. This was 5 trillion. Five trillion dollars was spent to prop up this 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 aberration of some type of made up disorder or whatever. Look at the amount of money that was added there. Five times that amount. Folks, these are numbers that you simply can't recall, re recover from. I mean, the average person, if they borrowed five times what it is that they're worth, I mean, geez, they probably would go bankrupt, too. So you're going to need at least 150 basis points cut just to re, re uninvert the real yield curve or to get the policy rate normally down, normalization down to a steep yield curve, we're sitting around talking 25 basis points here. That means they got to drop the interest rates. And when they drop the interest rates, they're basically saying that the dollar interest rate wise is worth less and less. So if something costs less and less and less, obviously the value is going down and down. Now it might be because there's an extreme amount of it. How much debt have they actually created? So the more debt they create, the more uh, the the water more water down the soup gets. So the big question is that the oxygen of credit and money creation is being cut off from the private sector because again the banks are not lending. They're not lending because they can't borrow short term and lend long term because there's not enough of a rate differential to stay in business. So the creation is being uh, money creation is being cut off from the private sector. The economic growth that we're seeing is generated by extreme progressive economic policy that has been implemented by President Joe Biden. Using the fog of COVID crisis to implement a strategy, I would success to you, uh, suggest to you the real reason why Jerome Powell is so upset is because they cut a deal with the Democrats in Washington when they COVID hit that they would create $5 trillion out of thin air during COVID. That's the graphic. So now we're going to move on to what is a budget deficit. 
So they only needed 1.5 trillion in order to be able to take care of the uh, only. <laughs> These numbers are outrageous, folks. And a billion seconds ago is 1959. A billion minutes ago, Jesus walked the earth. And a billion hours ago, nothing two-legged walked the earth. Now a trillion is a thousand billion. They spent 1.5 trillion just to cover their expenses and putting all this jazz out to the world. But they actually created another five, five trillion total. Boy, it sure must be nice to belong to the Insiders Club except when it comes time to pay the piper you can avoid the con you can avoid reality but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality okay so again you can avoid reality folks those of you that are doing this to the rest of the world but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality our day is coming you saw what just happened on friday while we were doing a podcast on friday the, the price of silver spiked up to thirty dollars and nine cents they pushed it back down again, but look how many, we're going to talk a look at how many naked paper shorts it took just to do that. So we need fiscal discipline. And so that's where we're at. I think it's just hilarious that nobody specifically in New York or in the Bay Streets in, in Canada talks about the obvious elephant in the room, and that's inflation, which is no longer really the risk. The unsustainable fiscal spending is the elephant that's in the room, the budget deficit. So let's take a look at what's going on here. How many of you have been told you're supposed to buy low and sell high? Well, we got the the Dow Jones Industrial Average here. So let me let, we'll cover that a little bit. <laughs> that's Sorry. okay. All right. So we got the budget deficit, Dow Jones Industrial Average. Okay, we'll come back to it. You want to help me out here? Sure. Okay, let's get this one up. Dow Jones Industrial Average, that one right there. Okay. I thought the idea with this, let's get rid of budget deficit. We'll get it back better. Uh, get it back, folks. I've got a, we have a vibe gourd coming in that one of our viewers um, has donated to us. Isn't that nice? So the vibe board will allow me to pull all this stuff up and the timing will be a lot better. Right now, uh, we're pulling it together. We're putting, uh, we're, as you have seeing that we put a little more effort into these in terms of trying to make it very, very, very transparent in terms of what we're explaining. So the obscure terms are not being used. I remember back in 2011, the S&P downgraded the, S the United States, a 20% correction in about a week. But again, let's take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average here. I thought you're supposed to buy low and sell high. Has anyone seen the Dow Jones any higher than today or Friday? I think it's time you sell, folks. You get out. This is they brought the the uh, the demand in from the future into today. We haven't seen the rest of this. There's another slide I'm going to show you. Uh, I think it's the next one. It's um, so this is uh, this stock market bull rally has been the longest American stock history American stock bull run in the history of the United States. Let's take a look at it. So let's take, okay, we'll get it together here, folks. So let's take a look here. We got the crash timeline here. What I'd like you to do is let's take a look at 1930 here, okay? Take a look at 1920 to 1930 and just from 1910 to 1920. Do you see this area in here? Do you see it on your screen there, honey? Maybe you could circle it with your, with your cursor, okay? See, so it's 1910, so you can focus in on 1910. Okay, let's move up from there. What I'd like you to do is take a look at the graph pattern that's right above in that 1910 all the way over to 1925 area, okay? And tell me whether or not you don't think that looks very similar to 2000 to 2010, okay? And then aren't you starting to see the run-up? You see the similarity in the chart here, okay? I'm not really a chartist because it's all manipulated, but certainly you're starting to see the plateaus, aren't you? Okay. And what happened in, in uh, 1928, the big 1929, the crash? Is that where we are right now? Do you see that as a possibility on the horizon? Okay. So in September 2021, when the S&P 500 downgraded the United States, 20% correction in about a week. That's what we're heading for. So this financial deficit that we're talking about, debt and deficit, why is that unsustainable? I mean, we've had a fiscal deficit for the better half of 15 years now. Imagine that. Could you run your affairs? Who is running the show? And why are these politicians going in there worth a hundred and some thousand dollars and they come out worth $140 million? Doesn't make any sense to me. It sure does, folks. We all know what's going on. We also know what's going on with the type one and type two, but I'm not going to talk about that because I'm in a lot of trouble for that. So at any rate, I'm going to stick up and, and talk about what is right. Okay. I just think it's reprehensible that the government would spend 10 to 10 years, a contract with a private company. And then at the end of the contract, the director of the mint steps down and the evils have been produced. 
then all kinds of stuff comes out. One guy says, oh, yeah, this is what it has. And, oh, no, I didn't say that. And somebody else, oh, this is what it has. Oh, I didn't say that. Goodness, folks, I'm not selling metal here. You got to figure out who you want to get the metal, the information from. I've given you the straight scoop. But for somebody to retract back on what they say, I mean, to them, I'd like to say this, to thine own self be true. These people that are watching us on inter on the internet on YouTube, they're trusting us for real information. We shouldn't use as a, as a soapbox just to sell stuff that because we have it in stock. That's wrong. So let's take a look at Japan. Let's take a look at what is going on. All right. So in Japan, um, they are currently one of the highest outside of China uh, and holders of the U.S. national debt. But guess what? China and Japan are no longer buying our debt. They're not buying our debt because they don't need it anymore. What they really need is gold and silver. And we think that that's what they've been doing with their treasuries that have been cashing in. So if the two largest buyers of the U.S. debt is China and Japan, and they're both not buyers anymore, they're simply not even sitting on the sideline. What they're doing is they're actually selling. So that's like putting the train in reverse. The train's going down the track and they're buying up all these bonds. Well, if they stop the train, the train doesn't buy any more bonds. The train goes in reverse, they sell the bonds. And that's even much worse than not being able to sell the bonds. So at any rate, uh, the, the top foreign holders of U.S. national debt are listed here, and we're seeing a big shakeup in that regard. So whew, getting to a situation is why should the Japanese investors and Chinese investors and European investors finance the fiscal debt of the United States? I don't see I don't see a real season reason to that. Um, if they don't, then they monetize the debt. And is that what they're happening now? If they monetize the debt, which is what we've always talked about, we're going to be throwing brick, you know, brick, uh, gold, uh, brick ball, <laughs> gold bricks at them. And they're going to be throwing U.S. treasuries back at us. OK, these treasuries are going to make us the way into our system and it's going to cause hyperinflation. You think gold and silver are on a tear now? Wait till you see what's actually going to happen. Because all this is going to rebalance against God's money. So, so the, the, the big banks, they can't hedge what's going on. They can't, they, they can't try to, uh, to borrow from the future in order to hedge their book today. Uh, the bottom line is the demand simply isn't there. Besides, the future is offering a lower interest rate than the interest rates today. So the banks really are in trouble. So if they try to normalize the rates and make the 30-year the rate go up higher than the, uh, than the six-month or two-year rate, It'll, it'll stall the whole economy. And the reason why is because we already burned that gas. OK, what I'm trying to say is that the United States has brought in demand from five and 10 years in the future into yesterday. And they did that by lowering the interest rates and by creating lots of money and inflating the value of it. OK, and then making everybody have this wealth effect that they're doing fine, even though they're up to their ears in debt and, and uh, just making minimum payments on the credit cards. So it, it's the math just simply doesn't work here, folks. I'm proving it to you. All right. We are on the doorstep of a foreign or uh, actually on the doorstep of a global currency crash all at the same time. It's been engineered to do this. This is the idea. All the all the BIS, all the, the tables of currencies that I have there are going to be replaced by real money that's backed by real money, by real assets real currency backed by real assets. So what you're holding right now, if you're holding anything digital is what's called digital fiat currency. If you're holding any notes in your, in your wallet, it's called fiat currency. Okay. But there is no currency on the state of the, of the planet right now because all currencies are fiat because no currency is backed by, by gold or silver with the exception of possibly Zimbabwe who announced that they were backing their Zimbabwe note with gold uh, two Fridays ago. So let's see whether or not that happens. So the position of the American bankers is that the people are just going to have to buy their, their fiscal policy and buy their fiscal debt. They don't have any choice. They want this to buy their treasuries. And some of you are saying, well, you know, I got my money safe. I'm inside the government and I have a FERS program or a CSRS and I have a TSP, which stands for a thrift savings plan. Well, inside the thrift savings plan, if you're a government employee, you're going to find that you're going to find the G fund in there. And the G fund is government debt. Well, goodness. If the U.S. runs out of debt, or runs out of money to fund their operations, and you've invested in government debt, guess where your money went? Might have gone to bombs over in Gaza. Who knows? Okay. The bottom line is, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. For those of you that are holding assets in a vault anywhere, please give this some thought. 
You don't know what the bars look like. You don't know how refined the Dory bars are. Most of the Dory bars that are coming in right now, people are trading this in while they can. They're shipping them directly to, uh, to a, a, a retailer. And what they're doing is they're weighing the incoming bars and crediting the amount of the weight incoming uh, against the spot price to what uh, eagles or dimes or whatever it is that, the, that, uh, that you all are looking for. But what we're finding, though, is that the process to get these bars out of the vault is very onerous. They're not taking the phone calls. you got to talk to 10 people. Only two people are going to make the decision. And guess what? We're not even in a crisis situation yet. So if someone else is holding your money, you better get out before the crap hits the fan. Because when it does, they probably won't even take your phone call. Think of all the thousands of people that have been talked into buying Dory bars, not even seeing what they are, being held in a different state. And they're not even a thousand ounces for those of you that bought these things. So anyway, don't worry about that. I have a plan. What I'd like you to do is just send me an email, ted at tedspeaks.net, and let me know that you're in that situation because we're putting something together. So at this point in time, I hope you guys have gotten some value out of this because we put a lot of effort into it. Put a little effort into this for us. Hit the thumbs up button, okay? Tell the YouTube algorithms, hey, this is something everybody needs to see. And then hit the uh, the like button. Says this is good stuff, okay? This is something everybody needs to see. Subscribe to it. And what's the other thing? Like, share, share and share. share. Please tell people about about our program here, okay? Whew, the trigger for the last economic uh, crash that we had was a global pandemic in two thousand eight. The cause uh, led up to the collapse of several banks. In 2001, we had a dead bubble and so forth. What we're seeing now is the de deflation. Deflation in the things that we don't need and inflation of the things we do need. We're seeing deflation or shrinkflation of the stuff that we buy that we need to eat. How many of you are buying things and you're finding out that a lot of the box is simply air? It's maybe you know two-thirds filled or whatever else. Of course, we will all remember the fact that it says that um, contents may shift and uh, creating some some uh, some space inside the box. They probably had more word, view it, uh, worded more eloquently than I just did. But at any rate, the bottom line is the bottom line. So what has happened is they've stolen the purchasing power from everyone. They've stolen it from me. They've stolen it from you. The only way you're going to get it back is you got to get the money by which they have used to entice you to give up so they can issue your, your uh, fiat currency to you. They're doing it again. They've been doing it thousands of times throughout history. They got it down. They know how it works and they know exactly how you're going to react because they've done it. They've even done it, what, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, how long ago was it that the uh, the euro came out? I think in 1996, right? So if you're in a different country right now, please tell us what, you're, what you found as far as your currencies are concerned. We know that we have viewers from all over the world right now. And uh, they're watching us from, let's see if we can get a full screen up here. In case they can see the different countries that we're broadcasting into or re receiving information from. Okay. So anyway, these are the different countries. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting here. And all these people from all these countries have the same kind of concerns. They don't own their stocks. They don't own their land. They don't own their money. The BIS owns it all, folks. And that's who's being put out of business right now. So let us know. Do you, do you like uh, seeing my face here and talking to you this way? Or do you like seeing the graphics? Let's see what you all think. So we talked a bit about value and deflation okay us can set let's just do it this way that we come to we need it okay look at the credit card debt sliding up the scale here right now trillion dollars how many of you can really pay that back with the cost of living increasing the way it is how many of you have extra money that have been racking up this debt like this what you've done is you spent tomorrow's money today as well same thing as the government done but guess what you're playing the you're playing the game they're playing so you're in debt they're in debt now, the key is if you take your debt and you get real money with it, which is what they did, then you're playing their game, but they're going to lose. We all know that. What about this time? I think it's going to blow up in the credit markets. The whole thing is going to start to show down, shut down because we're watching the, um, the Federal Reserve reverse repo operations, and we're seeing that the amount of, of currency that they're allowing to go back into our economy is shrinking. Take a look at it. It's the Federal Reserve reverse repo operations. It was as high as $2.9 trillion, and that's a daily number. A daily number. Can you believe that? $2.9 trillion? Folks, it's all funny money. You got If you've never had $10,000 of, of eagles on your lap, you haven't lived. I'm telling you, it weighs about 40-some pounds. And a monster box on your lap, that should be the representation of your years of effort, your years of study, your years of education, your years of toil, your years of doing without, your years of doing for other people, the years of planting seeds. It belongs to you. When you let somebody else hold your wealth, 
in its truest form, silver and gold, or even replications of it. You're allowing them to hold what God gave you as a gift. It's called providence, folks. When you give someone else your money, when you give them someone else your purchasing power, they can then hypothecate it, rehypothecate it. They can, they can use the providence, the purity of your labor to borrow against. And that what might be happening in some of these vaults. Very interesting. I had a phone call and had a conversation with a guy that had to walk through a vault. And he was surprised at how empty the vault was. Huh. Well, how are they making any money if the vault is empty? Interesting. He said that the number of, of, of uh, cubbies in the vault that were empty was staggering. So where is the income coming from to make the vault expenses? What percentage of the vault needs to be filled up with people's money paying premiums or paying, paying rental fees in order to keep the vault viable? This is serious stuff, folks. One of you called me and said you had 50 1,000-ounce Dory bars in a vault that you've never seen that was, ex that was <laughs> excoriated from you, I think. He called me up and almost and the lady was in tears. He said, I don't have any money to pay my medical bills. What do I do? They're saying that if I touch it, I'm going to get hit with all kinds of tax and penalties and fees to get the money out. Well, you know what, folks? You let them have it. So fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Don't let them fool you again. So while those things can be converted into real money of your country, regardless of what country you're in, get the money of your country. If you're holding Dory bars, they're not money. It's silver as an investment. It's still a good investment, but it's not money. And also, if you're holding a Dory bar, it most likely does not weigh a thousand ounces. Most Dory bars weigh between 960, 950 ounces to possibly 1,040. But guess how many bars come out weighing 1,040? So they're Dory bars. They're rough output bars for the most part. They then have to be shipped off to a refiner. And then they have to, and then what happens is it refined to a purity level that can be used for industry or also for money. So quite frankly, I think that the Europeans and the, uh, um, the Japanese and the Chinese, I think they're dead, gone sick and tired of buying the debt that we're using to wage war against them in one way, shape, form, or another, or contain them or control their money. So what's happened a while back is they got sick and tired of this. So they created something called the CIPS. It was originally China. China set up what's called the Chinese Interbank Payment System, CIPS. And other countries got wind of this, and they said, hey, what are you all doing? And they said, we are sick and tired of the United States controlling us and creating and, and telling us what our currency is worth. Because we in the U.S., we have something called the FX markets and also the, uh, the Exchange Stabilization Fund that was funded by a guy by the name of Leon Wana with $2 trillion. So the U.S. government can get in. They can manipulate foreign currencies. Well, if we are the big stick, if we are the, the, uh, the world reserve currency, the dollar, okay, we have that power to do that. And the rest of the world simply have had enough of it. So these other countries got on board with China and said, we want to be a part of this too. And China said, hey, more than Mary, this is going to work for us too. So they changed the name from the Chinese interbank payment system to the cross-border interbank payment system. Now, SWIFT is the direct competition. SWIFT is an acronym for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. Okay, That's the jogger that the, the U.S. had. That's what they were beating everybody else over the head with. Okay, they were charging money to take their currency in and turn it into into petrodollar, then charge it back, and uh, and a fee for the actual taking into the currency, and, and the fee for transferring the currencies, and all this stuff, and facilitating the trade. I mean, it's all just a bunch of number pushing stuff. But they had complete control over what was allowed and what the exchange rates were. So the rest of the world said, "This is it." So we've had enough. You got people in Ethiopia that are starving to death. People over here, our people are living high on the hog. I mean, they're eating their fudge rounds. They're not missing a meal. So uh, we take real good care of our poor people, but the rest of the poor people around the country, they starve around the world. So that's going to have to change. Bottom line, folks, if you want to be paid in something real in the new economy, you're going to have to do something real. And if you can't do something real, they're going to give you a period of time to learn to do something real. And if you can't get out of bed on your own at the right time because you're 18 to 22 years of age, they're going to get your butt out of bed and you're going to learn respect and you're going to learn what it is to read and write. You're going to learn real stuff and you're going to learn to be responsible. And that's what America needs. And that's what your country needs. They don't need you to sit in the basement, smoke a pot or whatever. I don't know what you're doing. So we have to uninvert in, in, invert the yield curve. We got to get the short term rates slower than the long term rates or many, many years ago when I was growing up, you know, when I was a young child, in 1982. <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> hey, don't laugh too loud about that one. <laughs> Now, I was at 58, I was born. But anyway, the way I was raised, if you don't have the money, you don't buy it. We were taught to save. 
and I had a paper out. I, I made four dollars a week delivering 96 newspapers a day, six days a week, rain, sleet, snow, or shine. And I lied about my age. I told him I was 11, I was 12. I was 11, I was 10. Couldn't have a paper out till you're 11 back then. So at any rate, I was I was really raking it in. I got four dollars a week coming in hot and heavy. <laughs> Wear out tennis shoes and all that kind of stuff. And one time, I think I had a health problem or whatever. My mom and dad drove me around. I sat in the back of the 1964 Ford Galaxy 500, a peacock blue. Anybody had one of those things? I sat in the back in the, in the trunk just throwing the papers out right and left. I think they burned up almost half a tank of gas. Take me around, around the paper route. It was a lot of fun. So, oh, my gosh. We have covered a lot of information here. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to really get a handle on what Keynesian economics is all about, because this has been the problem. OK, look how much control the government has in an economy that embraces Keynesian economics. But what I'd like you to do is to read this. OK, get it off of a website um, and compare that to Austrian economics. That's about a free monetary uh, system. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about using your God-given talents and bringing them to fruition and what you can do for other people, building a better mousetrap, building another, a better application, a better car, better ways to do things. That's what we need. This modern monetary theory stuff is absolutely crap. Have you heard of it? It's called MMT, modern monetary theory is an argument that you can spend money to basically infinity and not cause inflation. Who thinks that's real? I think it's BS. Let's call it out for what it is. But that's exactly what's going on right now. And that's called Keynesian economics as opposed to Austrian monetary economics. The modern monetary theory argument just simply doesn't work. So what's the aftermath? What's the aftermath? You want me to show you the aftermath? I'll show you again. Look at this. Okay. Here's the aftermath. The aftermath is the funk currencies. Okay. And here they are all over here. I'm going to get around the back of the table. Make sure I got this thing lined up here. Okay. You got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. These are all currencies from people around the world that were jilted just like you were to give up the silver in exchange for these notes. Now, if I had the notes, did they get the silver back? No. What did the United States do? Oh, look at this $5 bill here. It says United States note, right? Well, what happened here? They kept them the same size. Looks about the same. Federal Reserve note. Who owns the Federal Reserve Bank? Does anybody know? How about the Bank for International Settlements? Okay. They are the company or their subsidiaries prior to the official formation that, that created each one of these notes. And look how official they are. Oh, my gosh. There's even a unique identifier on each unit here, right? Unlike the shares of stock that you have, right? You don't have a unique identifier on that. Now, I understand that what they're doing is a little bit of pushback here as far as the stocks are concerned. What they're doing is saying, oh, well, we're giving your transaction a QCIP number. Well, that's nice. So you got a thousand cars that are being traded, but this is the transaction number, okay? But what cars are included in that 1,000 car transaction? You don't know, do you? Right. See the kind of stuff going on? I think the reason why a lot of podcasters won't have me on their station is because if they're talking about stocks and bonds and mutual funds, they certainly don't want a retired certified financial planner coming out of the background telling you that you don't own your same stocks like David Webb did in his book, The Great Taking. Didn't he do that too? Yeah, well, I don't really care, folks. You know, I'm going to give you the truth. I have no agenda. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm trying to help you. You got to get the money of your country. And right now, if you're in the United States of America, those dimes, I think, are the best way to go. Now, when we first started talking to you, those bags of dimes were under $20,000. We rounded up to $20,000 to give you an idea of what an ounce of silver would cost in constitutional money. So it takes 14 dimes to make one troy ounce, okay? So if each dime costs 2 bucks, meaning it's $20,000 a bag, then you're looking at $28, $2 a dime times 14 dimes is $28. Well, now the bags are, if you can find them, $22,000. And we only started broadcasting in uh, March 1st. So since March 1st, the type ones are just about gone. The dimes are just about gone. The prices are skyrocketing. Now they're running after quarters. The type twos, not too many people wor worry about, but don't have to worry about that too much anyway, because Ventures Gibson stopped making them. What? They're not making any more type type two American Silver Eagles. No, they're not. No, they're not. They stopped March 1st. Take a look at their, their mint reports. Check with Bix Weir. He's the guy that's spilling all the beans on this stuff. 
So at any rate, I suggest you follow him. He does a lot of work and he has a site that you can sign up and support his work. I think it's like $2.99 a year, but uh, he gives out a lot of late breaking information. I just wish that when you say something, you stick by it. So at any rate, we know about Keynesian economics. We know about Austrian monetary economics. I tell you, folks, if the Fed does not fix the yield curve and we do not correct the yield curve in terms of steepening the long end of the yield curve rates, like the 20 and 30 year rates, um, this is a real bad thing. It's going to lead to uh, to, a comp to a depression normally. OK, but there's a better plan before we get to the depression there'll be a complete currency reset. All the fiat currency that's currently, I showed you on the board over there, showed you on those tables, all the bad stuff's going away and you're going to be given new currency, okay? But you need to come out of this currency reset with assets on the other end. And the asset in this particular case is going to be real money of your country, the coin of the realm, okay? Now, some people are out there saying, well, you know, uh, the bars and rounds are the same as, uh, the same as uh, constitutional silver. They're not. They're spelled differently, folks. The bars and rounds are subject to taxation and reporting, whereas constitutional money is not. OK, and for those of you that think that Bitcoin is the way to go, I suggest you take a look at our mining video. I took a, min a mining video and I was going to expose that, but it's just too much information to do tonight. I'm going to get into that, though, because the mining video I put together, there's a lot of work that goes into mining silver out of the ground. Mining Bitcoin, I think you need warehouses full of energy. OK, and then when you finally figure out a, a calculation correctly, you're given a reward. The lady said that the way you get Bitcoins is you correct, collect rewards. And who are these rewards being given by? God? Magma? Silver and gold coming up from the center of the earth? Or somebody on top of the earth simply creating it on a keyboard? Additionally, they tell you there's 21 units of Bitcoin. The reason I'm going into this, folks, is there's a huge push to get Bitcoin accepted into the into the more um, uh, advanced realms of financial planning. That Bitcoin is a stable asset. It is not. No more stable than it was with the Holland tulip bulb mania. Take a bite out of a, pit, a tulip bulb and ruin the whole investment. There isn't any, there's nothing even to take a bite out of here. You're not mining anything. You take a look at what mining really is all about. I understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to take something that is thousands of years old, goes back 3000 BC and, and connect something that is an aberration, something that isn't real and connect something that isn't real to that, hoping that you'll fool people enough to come along with a Bitcoin ride. But what you're really doing is you're taking the stress off the physical money side. Somebody sent me a very intelligent comment, and I want to repeat it to you. He said, what do you think would happen, Ted, if the demand for Bitcoin and crypto went into physical metal instead? You know what my answer was? Silver and gold would be unaffordable, un unavailable. The amount of money that these people are putting into stuff, it reminds me so much of the, of the tulip bulb mania that I hope that you can get the me message out and save these people. Because many people, they regard their whole body, their whole persona about how much money they have. Well, the thing is, most people don't have any money at all. Only one half of 1% hold real money in the strictest sense. Okay. So we need to be talking about what's real. Money is real. Currency, when it's redeemable back for the money, is real. Fiat currency is not real. Digital fiat currency is not real. And any proxy into the dollar, which would include Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, or stocks or bonds or mutual funds or anything that is only convertible back into the dollar is going to be worthless. Yep. Take it to the bank. So when the Fed pivots and they admit that they need to cut the interest rates, silver and gold are going to skyrocket because even the blind will see at that point. <laughs> the scales will fall off their eyes, like hopefully the scales have already fallen off your eyes so far. So the banks, t flat out, they simply waited too long. They should, have, they should have corrected this problem in the very get-go. But then they wouldn't have achieved their results. They wanted us all in a lockdown. This COVID thing was supposed to be a lot more permanent than what it was. Now, a lot of you have paid the ultimate price, and I'm sorry about that. And you're not on here to, for, for me to talk to. I'm sorry about that, too. I tried to do everything I could. I didn't, never wore a mask. I was always against the jab and did everything I did to, to stop people from getting it. So we're all realizing that that was a big mistake. So there will be war uh, tribunals. There will be hangings and there will be um, uh, crimes against humanity prosecuted against these people. And it will be a big public spectacle because we will make sure it never happens again.
So again, nothing can stop what is coming. But also go on the website. Be proud of who you are and that you're learning stuff. We have hats out there right now, Ted Head hats, and I think they're like $18.99. We got mugs, Ted Speaks mugs for $6.99. They're all at cost. Nobody's making any money. The people that are going to make sure that you get what it is that you're purchasing, they're all volunteering. Ben is volunteering. Cindy's volunteering. Tina's volunteering. My wife, Margaret Ann, is volunteering. Um, Joe, uh, goodness, the list Carl. goes on and on. I'm sorry? Carl. Carl. Yeah, please put Carl in your prayers. Carl is, uh, I send him texts and emails nowadays, and uh, I don't hear from him on a regular basis. So you just go to Carl's Corner on our website and tell him, send him a message of love, if you wouldn't mind, from you and me too. So an economic mirage is mentioned that several of the economic indicators that look positive are actually deceptive. Do you really think unemployment is the way it is right now? Is a, re is a replacement of a temporary or part-time job equal to that of a full-time job that was lost? Does a part-time job give you benefits? Does it give you a 401k, something to retire on? No, folks. Uh-uh. They work it, they work it to bone. And I know people are working two and three and four jobs in order to keep the their head out of the water. But who's raising the kids? The TV set is. So at any rate, let's go take a look at the US debt clock and see what's going on. The US debt clock is really running out of control here. We're winding up with the M2 money supply continuing to decrease. And the claims against the M2 money supply being the money that you think you have in your checking account continually going up while the amount of money that can be cleared by the M2 money supply continue to go down. So uh, when that goes down to zero, all right, which it's heading there now, do you see down here where I'm circling? You may have to use your uh, cursor there, honey. It's, it's a circle around it. The 20 trillion 635, that's the total amount of money in the checkbook. Now the claims against the amount in the checkbook Move your cursor a little bit so it gets rid of the uh, wealth-based debt. Okay, there you go. So you got six hundred twenty-three trillion five hundred seventy-one billion. Okay, plus the the ooh forty. What is that number up there? Thirty-four trillion. Thirty-four trillion. Okay, thirty-four trillion dollars in debt. So if we add that to the six hundred twenty-three and then do the calculations, you're less than three percent. Which means that if you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Only $3,000 is actually there if you're going to split it evenly with everyone else. So let's take a look at what the um, very bottom line, and let's take a look at what's going on with the U.S. total national assets. Those assets, look, they're going down, $178,696,000,000, uh, uh, billion, right? And what are the liabilities? Scoot on over there to the right side. We're going to take a look at the unfunded liabilities, $214,573,000,000, okay? And I know I told you this a couple of times, but we have new people. You know, over 50% of the people watching aren't even subscribed. If you guys would subscribe, you help us. It would get the word out to more people. It would be more of a search engine thing for people to be wanting to learn about Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and gold and silver and what dollars are really all about and everything. So at any rate, when you'll see that the unfunded liabilities exceeds the total national assets, but the unfunded liabilities is growing while the assets are going down. Same thing with the credit and currency derivatives. Now that is currently growing. Okay, as the, you got to slide the screen over a little bit so they can see what the uh, there we go, so that they can see that the U.S. M2 money supply is continuing to come down. So the M2 money supply is coming down. The claims against the M2 money supply, your money that's in your checking account or your credit or your uh, your brokerage account or whatever, it could be a four million dollar stock brokerage account. Bottom line is only three percent of that is available to be cleared. Okay especially when you add in the uh, 20, the, the 43 trillion top part of my screen is cut off here. Okay. At any rate. So the total debt was 34 trillion. You'd add that to the 623 trillion. So there's no need to cut rates is what they're saying. As far as the Keynesian is concerned, because the economy is still strong. Well, they reference a Phillips curve. The economic concept developed by A.W. Phillips stated that inflation and unemployment have stable and inverse relationships. So what it's saying is as in unemployment goes down, okay, I guess inflation would go up. Or as inflation goes up, unemployment goes down. Hmm. Oh, we need to do a little bit more studying on that. So the inverse relationship between employment and unemployment and the rate of inflation, things we need to be studying and taking a look at because these aren't quite right, are they? Again, this is all falls underneath the Dickensian economic model as opposed to the, um, the uh, Austrian monetary model. 
So you're going to hear terms like produce, uh, producers uh, purchasing matters index. Okay, the purchasing matters index is called PMI. I think we have a slide for that. If you want to bring that up, please come to know this stuff, folks. It's important. Once this is over, you can forget it. Just help me, help me get the word out, and help me land this plane. You're all on board this plane, is what I'm looking at. Okay, and I'm the pilot, and I'm bringing it down. For, can we pull that up? Purchasing matters index. We got a couple slides here. Okay. All right, so an index that measures the month-over-month -month change in economic activity within the manufacturing sector. So if this activity is going down, okay, that's not very healthy, is it? The United States is 75% services, and the services of PMI, who are the people <coughs> purchasing managed index, who are people conveniently ignore, was atrocious. So you got to ask yourself, these pundits who are talking up the stock market, talking up these indexes and everything, what is their agenda? What are they trying to do? What are they selling? If somebody tells you that there's no difference between constitutional silver and bars and rounds, what are they trying to sell you? Do they have any constitutional in stock? Why don't you ask that question? So, folks, you're going to have to look the stick up for yourself until uh, in, in, until the swamp is completely flushed. Okay? So... The people in the real world will see a dramatic slowdown in spending. You should be seeing that too. Going to the grocery store, what are you seeing? They're hiding it a lot because most, a lot of people now are doing what's called online shopping. So you go to the grocery store and you see one person pushing a cart with 10 different backs and boxes in it. These are people, professional shoppers who go around the grocery store and they pick stuff off the shelves and put it in different boxes for you. And I think they charge for that at six or eight dollars. I don't know. So at any rate, the last thing I'd like you to stay focused on here, folks, is Bitcoin, stocks, and bonds. They're going to be coming after you hard for this stuff. Learn to say no. Learn to say no. Um, there's a couple other things I want to get into. There's something about uh, not making a decision. Uh, let's get into that. There were some, some things that I brought up. I think we're going to save that, though, for Sunday. Okay? Um, it's going to be a very interesting show. We're going to be talking more about um, your mind, your thinking, the way you should be interpreting things. And uh, ways that you can tell people are looking out for your best interest and ways to, to spot people that might be out looking out for their own best interest. So um, stay in touch with that. Um, anyway, I think we've done enough here for today. I hope you, you felt as though you got your money's worth. If not, hit that like and subscribe and share button. And let's uh, let's see what your comments are. Folks, if you have any questions, Mailbag Monday is coming up. Tomorrow is uh, Silver Sunday Sermon with Dr. Pel uh, Pastor Norris Belcher. And uh, 40 some years of pastoral experience. I, know, I don't know you, but I certainly found a connection. They learned something. We learned that a talent is an is enormous amount of silver back in biblical days. And all of us have been given a talent. It's a God given talent. You ever heard that before? Oh, he has a God given talent in this. Everybody has a talent. You just need to find yours. Maybe it's loving your husband. Maybe it's uh, gardening. Maybe I don't know what your talent is, but God's given us all talent so that we can help each other and work each other. So the way I look at this is God's all put us all in here on earth and he's seeing whether or not we're going to help each other, hurt each other. All of us have different gifts. Are we going to support one another? There's a very close friend of mine right now. It's going very, very tough economic time and he's very embarrassed. I'm praying for him. I, I saw this coming years ago and it was a little bit too high on the hog and the fall from grace at that level is very uncomfortable. So folks are there. There, there are people that are hurting out there. But uh, know that you have a respite here. You have a place that you can come and you can talk with other like-minded people. We are putting a silver show together. I'm sorry what happened in Georgia. They wouldn't give us the contract to get together. I don't know why. But uh, we are going to pull it off. And we're going to get our friends from Canada to come down too. There are people up there that are very lonely. They can't buy silver up there like you guys can. And people in Minnesota, wow, I don't know what's going on with you guys out there. But apparently, they want to charge you guys sales tax. So, um Reach out to me privately. I might be able to have a way that I can help you. So if you're in Minnesota and, and you're interested in securing some constitutional silver, because uh, that's the only stuff that I would recommend at this point in time, as long as it's available, you should be looking at dimes, quarters, and then type one eagles, and then go back to half dollars, dollars, and then we'll have to start moving with the type one American gold eagles. But the value isn't there as it is right now. Again, you can buy an ounce of constitutional silver, even in today's currency, okay, for under 20, for around $22, uh, $2.20 for a dime, which would make an ounce of silver worth about $30.40 if you do the math. 
So, folks, thanks so much for tuning in. We got more programs. We got more information coming out. If uh, you wouldn't mind, send me a little note. Tell me what you think about the program here. Is it better me talking to you, or you like the uh, the visual slides, or would you like me to hold up some stuff? Um, this kind of stuff we didn't even have a chance to get into. We will to Kenzie and economic model. I don't want to spend too much time on Kenzie and economics because it's really not where we want to be. We want to be empowering people. Okay. We want people to become entrepreneurs again. We want cottage industries. We want new technologies. We want inventions. We want women to back to help us grow our country again. Okay. We love women. We love mothers. We love babies. It's what God gave us to do. At any rate, I'm doing my part. I know you're doing your part. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for becoming friends. And uh, say hello once in a while. I do return phone calls. Anybody that uh, that's out there that has, please tell them, hey, Ted, it's a real guy. And one person said, boy, I'm surprised you called me back so quickly. Well, this is just the way we do hear things here, folks. This isn't a job for me. It's a hobby. Um, not making any money out of this. I sold the practice in 2010. It was a full-blown estate planning practice with $700 million in assets under management. I built from scratch. So here we are, what, 14 years later from 2010 to present, and uh, we're doing it all over again. But this time it's for you. You guys treated me fine. Everybody got happy there, too. We're going to be talking about estate planning. There are terms you guys are learning that are saving you a lot of money. One guy wrote in and said, hey, look, the terms that you gave me gave me an absolute leg up. When I use those terms like interorum clause and persterpes in my initial meeting with the estate planner, the whole meeting took a different turn. He realized he was dealing with somebody that knew what they were doing. So you got to you got to coach in your corner. OK, I'm in your corner and I'm not going to let you fail. You keep me in your corner and we'll make this through together. Follow the advice. It's not self-serving, folks. It's for help you. God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.